Well, let me begin by saying hello to the ladies in our night class and to those watching online. And to all our ladies, I need to remind you that fall break is October the 16th, and that's coming up in two weeks. Now, there will be no class on October the 16th, but classes will resume the following week, which is October the 23rd, and on October the 23rd, we'll be on lesson number five. So, last week in lesson two, our study defended Paul's apostleship, and we examined how Paul's was different from Peter's apostleship. We also study the body of Christ's church with Paul as its apostle and how it is different from the kingdom of heaven church with Peter as its chief apostle. Well, now this week we're going to go a step further. We're going to study the differences between Paul's gospel and Peter's gospel and it's actually those differences that created the need for the meeting at Jerusalem. It was a critical meeting. It's important that we grasp both the reason for the meeting and the outcome. So let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we are grateful Paul's gospel of grace prevailed at the Jerusalem meeting. Now guide us now as we study your word to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, let's begin by locating our scripture. We will start off. Uh, by reading Galatians 2, 1 to 10, which that's what our lesson was over this week. And then we had the companion passage of Scripture, which is actually Acts uh, 15, 1 to 35. But because of time, uh, we will read together 1, 1 to 15, 1 to 7, and 28 to 32. And then later on in our talk here, I'm going to have you go back to Galatians 2, 7, because there's something I want to point out, but that's later in our talk. So let's just begin now by reading Galatians 2, 1 to 10 together. Then 14 years After I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also, and I went up by revelation. Are we, does everybody have their scripture? Are we all ready to go? Okay, I'm sorry. I thought I heard something. Two, and I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had ran in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren unaware brought in, who came in privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage." To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepted no man's person. For they, but for they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me, but contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. For he that wrought affectionately in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me towards the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they into the circumcision. Only that... Only they that we should remember the poor, the same also was forward to do. And let's go over to Acts now, 15. And we'll read together just two passages out of what all we read this week. And we'll start with uh, verse 1 and read it down through 7. Are we all in Acts 15 now? We're all there? Okay, good. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and 
disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem and to the apostles and elders about this question. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenice and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. But there rose up certain of the sect of Pharisees, which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Now, just to summarize uh, in the rest of that passage before we pick it up again in... um, 28 you really have peter he starts talking uh james talks and james talks quite a while and they talk in favor of the gentiles and then uh, james brings up the idea of, of writing letters the importance of letters and then the personal touch of sending a, two of their own men there from the church of antioch to go back with them Uh, from Jerusalem to Antioch and so they talk again about the letters there's something very significant though that they say in verse 24 um, for as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words so they're referring to the Judaizers subverting your souls saying ye must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. So James is letting them know we didn't send those Judaizers out. You know, he's making that point. And then we, he's just continuing to talk about the letter and how, um, you know, how it was what they were going to do. Now in verse 28, and we'll read that down to 32. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication, from which if you keep yourself, you shall do well, fare you well. So when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch, and when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the epistle which they had read and rejoiced for the consolation. And Judas and Silas, being prophets also themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. Well, let's turn to page one of our uh, study outline. And let me give you the important word, the word of the week. And the word of the week is meeting. No surprise there because our main topic this week is the meeting at Jerusalem. That's your word of the week. And you may notice many times I have a little spot for it up in the corner of the form there. Well, ladies, the outcome of the meeting in Jerusalem held great significance for the early church and for us today. Now, let's consider the big picture so we can see how God was working behind the scenes, ensuring that the gospel of grace prevailed. We know that one of Satan's wiles is to pervert the gospel and the word of God, but we know that God always prevails. Now, let's review the background of this meeting as though we're a silent observer. I like to think of like a little mouse in the corner because we need to We need to grasp this whole meeting. So let's just pretend, like when we took our journey before, that we're there at that meeting because the Scriptures gives us enough detail that we can actually recreate it and think it and learn it from the the Scriptures. Well, first of all, let's establish the background. This was the first big controversy, and that's your blank, controversy amongst the followers of Christ. This was the first great controversy amongst the followers of Christ. A, news of Paul's successes with the Gentile converts, that's your next blank, converts, had reached the Jerusalem church. They had heard how the Gentiles were receiving Paul's gospel and were not being circumcised. This stirred up a controversy because some of the Jewish believers 
thought circumcision and even keeping the law were necessary to be saved. And that's your other blank, saved. These Judaizers went to the Antioch church and they argued with Paul and Barnabas. Now to settle this dispute, that's your next blank, to settle this dispute, and it was a dispute, the Antioch church, and the Antioch church, remember, is Paul's home base. To settle this dispute, the Antioch church decided to send Paul and Barnabas to the Jerusalem church, and the Jerusalem church is the home base for the 12 apostles. To learn what the apostles there really thought. Did these men who were arguing with Paul and Barnabas really express what Peter and the apostles believed? They needed to know. Well, Paul gives us another reason why he went to the meeting in Galatians 2 too. And see, that's why it's important to examine both accounts, the account in Acts and the account of Galatians, as you've already learned. There are some important details that you'll only get if you look at both accounts. You'll miss out on some things. You, one of them, you would, if you just went to Acts, you would have missed out on the reason Paul gave for going to the meeting in Galatians 2 too. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any mean I should run or had ran in vain. God, that's your blank, God told Paul to go. It was by God's, it was time, it was God's time to settle this dispute. God had determined the time God was going to settle it, he sent Paul there, and Paul knew God was sending him, of course. So uh, Paul understood what was going on. Two, the meeting attendees. So now we have the background. We know why there's a meeting. Now we need to consider the meeting attendees. Who was there at the meeting? From Antioch, Paul, Barnabas, and Titus. At Jerusalem, where they went, Peter, James, and Simeon, or John, the apostles, and two groups of Jews. First group, Jews who held you must also be circumcised to be saved, and Jews from the sect of the Pharisees saying you must also be circumcised and keep the law of Moses to be saved. Well, let's consider Paul's attitude, that's your next blank, Paul's attitude at the meeting. And this is important. Paul was confident. After all, he was there by revelation of God. He wasn't worrying. He knew God was in control. He had an air of confidence about him. B, Paul wasn't looking for their approval, only their understanding. Their understanding. And Paul wasn't looking to learn, that's your next blank, Paul wasn't looking to learn something from anyone there. After all, he had the best instructor, the heavenly Jesus. Now the meeting begins. Just imagine the scene. We, we've got the background, we have the meeting attendees, we know Paul's attitude. Now the meeting begins. Imagine the scene. Well, when Paul and Barnabas first arrived, the apostles and the elders welcomed them. That's your blank. Welcomed them. Then Paul and Barnabas told the Jerusalem church all that God, that's your blank, God had done with them when they preached the word of God to the Gentiles throughout Galatia. And we're all familiar with that because that was Paul's first missionary journey and when he went on that first missionary journey, that's where he established those churches in Galatia that he ended up writing this letter to that we're studying right now. So can anyone just speak out some of those churches? They were, they were the cities that we visited on that missionary journey. Just think for a moment. Maybe picture the map in your mind. Derby, right. Der I call Lystra, good. So we have Iconium, Lystra, Derby, Antioch, Antioch of Syria, and also Antioch of 
Pisidia. And remember, Antioch of Pisidia was the one most like Rome. Remember that? Remember? And then, do you remember where was Bar-Jesus? He was the one that tried to stop that dep Roman deputy, sorcerer. And wasn't he on that island? Remember, we C Cyprus, the island of Cyprus. See, you guys are doing great. I mean, because those, those are some hard names to remember. Well, good job, good job. Well, D, certainly there was excitement in their voices and joy, that's your blank, joy on their faces as they spoke. They must have had the attention of the Jerusalem church. Just imagine the scene. All the eyes and the ears were on them. They, were, they wanted to know what they were saying, and they were, they were excited at the news that they were hearing. But before the church could relish the joy of what Paul told them about the Gentile believers, some men threw a wet, a wet blanket on the scene. They were a real downer. There were some believing Jews from the sect of the Pharisees who spoke up and declared that the Gentiles must be circumcised, that's your blank, must be circumcised and keep the law of Moses to be saved. And remember how Paul and Barnabas were arguing with those men that came up from Jew. Um, from the Jerusalem church. Well, it's possible that Paul and Barnabas even recognized some of these men as the ones they had recently argued with in Antioch, isn't it? Now, during the meeting, it became known that Titus, that's your next blank, Titus, a, a Greek believer, did not think he needed to be circumcised. Titus accompanied Paul and Barnabas to this meeting. And he understood Paul's gospel of grace, which he had both heard and received. So he refused to be circumcised because he understood it wasn't necessary to be saved. Now, these Judaizers were confronted now with a Gentile convert who refused circumcision. Paul had made his point, hadn't he? And couldn't this very well have been the reason why Paul had Titus follow him and go with him up there to Jerusalem to make his point? And if we know something about Titus, Titus had a very strong personality. So it wouldn't have, he could have just went like water off a duck's back, any of the comments that they may have made to him there. So um, anyway, H, now at this point, that's your next blank. At this point in the meeting, there was a lot of disputing brought on by the Pharisees. Then the apostles and elders of the Jerusalem church decided to have their own meeting to discuss what they were just heard. So just imagine it. When, when, when these Judaizers spoke up, everyone in the congregation, there was arguing going on, and, and, and the apostles knew they had to get away if they were going to resolve anything, and that's just what they did. But then when they got into their own meeting, there was more disputing, and Peter rose up calming things down. It must have been quite a scene. After Peter spoke in favor of the Gentiles, he was joined by Simeon, uh, James and Simeon, or John, and they spoke in favor of Paul's gospel of grace for the Gentiles. Now, finally, the decision. A decision has been made. James, now remember, James is not the Apostle James, but he's Jesus' half-brother. James advises writing a letter to Antioch and to send Judas and Silas back with Paul, Barnabas, and Titus to the Antioch church. That seems like a personal touch. Not only do you send the letters, which is something that they can circulate around the other churches, but you send some of your own people back, some of your own uh, pastors back to reassure these uh, Gentile believers at Antioch. The apostles at the Jerusalem church also sent their greetings to the Gentiles in Antioch and, and Syria and Cilicia, making clear that they did not give a commandment that ye must be circumcised and keep the law to be saved. This commandment did not come in the apostles in Jerusalem. So the Ju Judaizers were actually acting on their own accord, and they were really speaking for themselves, not the twelve. The letter says, that's your next blank, the letter says, first we had a decision, now we have the letter that follows. 
for it seemed good to the Holy Ghost, and that's important that we, the Holy Ghost, God himself was involved in this letter. God himself was involved in this decision. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us, and to us, to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which if you keep yourselves, ye shall do well. Uh, and this might be a good place to mention, the word is necessary. It is not a commandment. The twelve apostles were not issuing a commandment to Paul. These are necessary things. Uh, in other words, in order for the Jews, uh, the believing Jews in Jerusalem and the Gentile believers in Antioch to really get along well, it would just be an advisable thing if the um, uh, Gentile believers would respect these issues in regards to the Jews. Um, they realized that they had the freedom to do these things. They weren't constrained by any dietary laws, but it would be a respectful thing to do. That's why it is a necessary thing. Well, the meeting ends at your next blank. The meeting ends on a note of understanding and friendship. And this is what Paul was after. He was after understanding and friendship. God had given Paul success. The apostles and elders understood Paul had a different, that's your next blank, had a different, under, a different gospel, and they were not to interfere. Paul's gospel came from the heavenly Jesus, just like the 12 apostles' gospel came from the earthly Jesus. Paul got the understanding and acceptance he was looking for. But contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was to Peter. You may be wondering why I'm emphasizing the word of, but we'll, we'll get to that later. For he, wrought, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me towards the Gentiles. And remember that the circumcision are the Jews... And the uncircumcision are the Gentiles. James, Peter, or Cephas, and, and John counted Paul and Barnabas as their friends. That's your blank. As, your, as their friends in Christ. Perceive the grace that was given unto me. They gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen or the Gentiles and they unto the circumcision or the Jews. Only that we should remember the poor, the same which also they were to do. That's Galatians 2, 9 to 10. Now on to page 3, and I better be careful not to get mixed up on my pages again. Okay, page 3. Paul, Barnabas, Silas, and Titus leave and return to the Gentile church at Antioch. And, and we're very familiar with Antioch of Syria, aren't we? And, and its relation to the Bible, and that's where all the godly manuscripts came from, isn't it? Uh, to, after the letter was read, it was a joyful, that's your blank, it was a joyful scene. The Gentiles rejoiced for the peace that gave them. Imagine what peace it gave Imagine the whole time that they were gone, Paul, Barnabas, and Titus, they didn't know what was going on. There, no, there was no text messaging. There was no phone calls. They just had to wait and wonder, was there going to be some changes that was going to come their way? They, they just didn't know. So when they returned and read this wonderful epistle, it was a joyful scene. The Gentiles rejoiced for the peace it gave them, and to top it all off, Judas and Silas from the Jerusalem church reassured these Gentile believers that they were accepted as fellow believers. And, you know, there's times you can read a letter, you can get a phone call, but when somebody just takes the time to come to you in person and they look you in the eye and they talk to you, it just has a special level of reassurance, doesn't it? I think it does. Now, in our box there, now that we've reviewed the meeting at Jerusalem and have rejoiced at its outcome, we need to go over the differences between Peter's gospel and Paul's gospel. 
Now, last week, we actually set the stage for this week's review of the two Gospels by studying the differences between Peter and Paul's apostleship. This week, we will see the differences between the two Gospels. First, we'll review some basic differences between Peter and Paul, just to get this fresh in our mind. First, Peter is the leader of the 12 apostles for the kingdom. That's your blank. Leader for the kingdom church. Christ reclaims the earth through the nation of Israel when prophecy is fulfilled. Two, Paul is the apostle of the body. That's your blank. Of the body of Christ's church. Christ reclaims the second heavens through the church, the body of Christ. In your box there. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. That's Colossians 1.20. Now in note, in context of the passage, all things refers to governmental authorities. Those governmental authorities that are both invisible, which reside in the second heaven, and visible that reside here on earth. Christ is head, is supreme over all authority. Now, three, a church is simply a called out assembly. There have been different churches throughout the Bible. We saw that last week. The church, the body of Christ, did not, that's your blank, did not begin at Pentecost in Acts 2. Remember, Pentecost in Acts 2 it was Jews only. There were no Gentiles there, Jews only. The, the house of Israel, you men of Judea. And also, there were no first days that happened at Pentecost. It was last days. Remember the prophet Joel spoke? And they talked about last days. That was the last days that prophecy had the nation of Israel had the leaders of Israel, had they accepted Christ as Messiah, they would have went from there into the tribulation period and then on into the, the kingdom, the thousand-year reign. But we know that they didn't. That didn't happen. So, But the point is nothing new was happening. There was no first days of something, only last days. And five, the church, the body of Christ began began when the Apostle Paul was saved and called by God in Acts 9 on the road to Damascus. Well, now that we've got all that fresh in our mind, let's study the two Gospels we've been reading and hearing so much about first. First, though, this is important what we need to do. We're going to compare what each Gospel requires one to believe to be saved, and then we'll look at some key differences. So those are going to be the three things we look at today what it requires to be saved, and then there's two key differences we're going to look at. But remember I said that we would go back to Galatians chapter 2, this, and we're going to do that right now. I'm going to go to Gal Galatians chapter 2. And I want to point this out to you because we've talked so much about the King James Bible and we talk so much about the godly manuscripts and why they are so important to have a uncorrupted version of the Bible, which a King James Bible is. When I came across this, I thought this is a great example to point out to you what happens when you use another Bible version that comes from those corrupted texts, which, remember, comes from Alexandria, Egypt. We remember that. Let's let, follow along as I read Galatians 2, 7. But contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of, note that word, the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. When you read that, what, how many gospels are involved that you get from that verse? Just holler it out. Two, two. Everybody seems to read two, correct? You wouldn't read that if you were reading an NIV or you're reading the New Living Translation or the New American Study Bible or the New King James even uh, or the Net Bible. I mean, I, I didn't print out a complete list. In those versions, it says, preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, just that he has given Peter the responsibility of preaching to the Jews. 
the uh, new the NIV is uh, I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcision, just as Peter had been to the circ the circumcision. Now, when you listen to that, how many gospels would you say you have? One. And why do you say that? Right, they, that one word, a two-letter word, they change from of to the word to, that you could just gloss right over and see how, I mean, this is things like this, and this is just one of many that you can easily miss, and that's just, that, that is critical because there are two Gospels, not one Gospel, and you would only get that if you had the King James Version. So I think I've probably said enough, but I thought that was very important that we, we become aware of that. And um, I, I, to follow up on that, I've got a quote from our pastor, Pastor Devning. It says, first consider, if Paul's gospel was the same as Peter's and the twelve, why would Paul have to go to Jerusalem to explain his gospel to the twelve? Think about it. And what made it necessary for Christ to leave his throne of glory to give Paul the same exact message the twelve had been preaching? It makes no sense. But the problem here is so many times Christians don't stop to consider, does this even make sense? Do they, do they look at everything in context? But that's what you're doing, and that's why you're seeing these things. Uh, number five, what did the kingdom gospel require to be saved, which is Peter's gospel. That's your, your go blank there, Peter's gospel. This gospel was to Israel. That's your next blank. Peter's gospel, this gospel was to Israel. Now, Peter's gospel required faith in Christ as their Messiah and works to show their faith was real. The following scriptures give Peter's gospel. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the re remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Works involved. But there rose up certain of the sect of Pharisees, which believed, these are believing Jews, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and command them to meet, follow the law of Moses. Now, the kingdom gospel had conditions. Kingdom believers had to believe Jesus was their prophesied Messiah, number one. Number two, they had to repent. Number three, they had to be baptized. And followed by number four, followed by being circumcised and keeping the law of Moses to be saved. It was faith plus works. Now, let's examine what does the grace gospel respond required to be saved. And this is Paul's gospel. That's your blank. Paul's gospel. This gospel is to both Gentile and Jew. It is the gospel that saves today. Saves today. It requires you to believe by faith that Jesus is the Son of God who died on the cross for our sins, that he was buried and rose again three days later. The following scripture gives Paul's gospel. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15. B, Paul's gospel requires no, no works. It is 100% through grace and is the gift of God. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, Ephesians 2. Paul's gospel is for, is for both Jew and Greek. We are all one in Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus, Galatians 3. In the box there, the grace gospel has no conditions. Simply believe by faith that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried and rose again three days later according to the scripture. Faith plus nothing. Christ did it all. Man adds nothing. 
Christ's death was the final payment God demanded for sin. He was raised by the Father from the dead. When we pour, put our faith into that, we receive forgiveness of sins. We are made alive and given the free gift of eternal life. That's Pastor Devney has said that. And I, to that I say, glorious grace, glorious grace. Well, now we've seen the difference in salvation between these two Gospels. Let's look at other key differences between the Kingdom Gospel and the Grace Gospel in these three areas. And these, the, there are big differences here. Number one, forgiveness. Number two, one Gospel was known beforehand. The other Gospel was not. One gospel requires water baptism, and the other gospel does not. Well, let's examine the area of forgiveness first. For those saved in the kingdom gospel, forgiveness is conditional. Forgiveness is conditional for those saved in the kingdom gospel. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. One, the kingdom gospel still follows the law. That's your blank. Follows the law. And the law is conditional. Two, their sins are blotted out when Christ returns to establish his kingdom. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when. There's a time frame added here. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. The presence of the Lord will happen at the second coming, which is when Christ comes to reestablish his kingdom that's when their sins are actually forgiven. Now we are ready for page five. Oh, my word. Don't tell me I've done it again. Okay, here it is. Okay, page five. Now, for those saved in the grace gospel, forgiveness is unconditional. Unconditional. We're going to see a huge difference between the grace gospel and the kingdom gospel. It is unconditional. And you, being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, hath, that is past tense, hath he forgiven together with him, having forgiven, past tense, you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, Colossians 2. And be ye kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Ephesians 4 32. Well, when we are saved, we are forgiven for all our sin, past, present, and future. Because remember, when Christ died on the, on the cross, all of our sin was in the future. And he died for all of it. When he died on the cross, it was all in the future. And we are not under the law. Remember, that was nailed to his cross. Second key difference. One gospel was known beforehand and the other gospel was hidden. D. The kingdom gospel was known by the Old Testament prophets. The Old Testament prophecies were preached as being fulfilled in the 12 apostles' messages, as we've seen in these scriptures, just where it's underlined, was spoken by the prophet Joel, again prophecy. Likewise foretold of these days, ye are the children of the prophets. And finally, having raised up his son Jesus, yes, the death of Jesus was prophesied, just not the accomplishments of his death. And that's key. They didn't know about the accomplishments. E, the grace gospel was not revealed by the Old Testament prophets and the 12 apostles. God kept it a secret. It was a mystery, as Paul tells us in Roman, where it's underlined. According to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, and a mystery is a secret, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and manifest means made known. 
A there. By keeping it a secret, that's your blank, keeping it a secret, God took Satan in his own craftiness. The twelve apostles did not understand the full accomplishments of the cross. It was this that was revealed by Paul to Paul by the heavenly Jesus. While Jesus' death was prophesied, the accomplishments of his death was not. And you just need to let that sink in because that's, that's really significant and that's not something that oftentimes people really, really understand. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world began, all of this before the world began, unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And we're familiar with that verse. You know, um, Satan and his, and his princes, with Satan it was never a matter of being more powerful than God. He understood that God was all-powerful. But remember, he was created with great wisdom and beauty, and he fancied himself as having a wise plan. A very wise plan. And isn't it just like our God that he kept this a secret? He knew how to do it and make Satan a fool, which is what he has done with his wise plan. <laughs> okay, on, on page 6, the third and the last key difference. The kingdom gospel required, that's your blank, the kingdom gospel required, and of course this is Jews in Israel, Water baptism or cleansing with water. It was a religious rite for, the, for Israel starting in the Old Testament. This rite prepared its priests to serve in the tabernacle and later in the temple. One day it would also prepare all Israelites to be priests when they became a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. So every Jewish believer had to be washed with water or baptized since Israel as a nation was to be a kingdom of priests. Baptism or washing with water was preparing them for the promised kingdom. The following scriptures show how Israel is a nation of priests and require the rite of baptism or water cleansing. Just where it's underlined for you to get the feel that Israel and priesthood are connected. And Israel and, his, and Aaron and his sons thou shalt bring unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and shall wash them with water and the priest's office. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. This is it, Israel again. And he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. This is, then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for revision of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Again, that's in Acts 2. So that would be right around the time of um, uh, Pentecost. And so again, it was the audience was Israel. So this is, does not concern anything new happening. This is, again, prophecy being fulfilled. And this is referring to the kingdom of heaven church, which is Israel or the Jews. G, the grace gospel does not, that's your blank, does not require water baptism. There is only a spirit baptism. At first, during the transition in Acts, Paul did baptize a few, but as he received further revelation from Christ, he stopped when he understood that baptism wasn't the same as it used to be. We learn this from the following scriptures. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One baptism, Ephesians 4, 5. And for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Greeks, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink in one spirit. So 
it's, it's important here, the book of Acts, for us just to remember, it's a transitional book. And since Paul did start doing some things, he was re continuing to see revelation. And he didn't learn everything all at once, just like we don't learn everything all at once. And as he learned these things, then he, he put them into practice. Consider, in your little box there, if a water baptism was required in addition to a spirit baptism, then there would actually be two baptisms instead of one baptism. And scripture tells us there is one baptism. It is a spirit baptism. And where it is underlined there, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Okay, in page 7. Okay, our very last page here. While there are important differences, and this is important too, while there are important differences, God is the author of both Gospels, and they have much in common. That's your blank. Both Gospels have much in common. Both Gospels are of God. That's your blank. Both Gospels are of, of God and about Christ. Both Gospels are of God and about Christ. God is the author of both Gospels. They are just for different dispensations. We just need to put them where they belong. They belong in their own dispensation. The grace Gospel reflects the full accomplishments of the cross. The full accomplishments of the cross. Paul was given the mystery truths. While the kingdom gospel does not, they didn't know anything about the full accomplishments of the cross, so there's no way that they could be part of their gospel. Two, the grace gospel understood his death as wonderful news because it meant we could re receive forgiveness for all our sins by his death. The kingdom gospel understood Jesus' death as bad news for Israel. Remember, they had killed their Messiah. I mean, that was bad news for them. Now, both Gospels serve God's purposes. That's your blank. Both go Gospels serve God's purposes. Remember, Christ will reclaim the earth through the nation Israel, and he will reclaim the heavenlies through the church, the body of Christ. And that familiar verse to us again, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, the full accomplishments of the cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And in context, those are the invisible governmental authorities in the second heaven and the visible governmental authorities here on earth visible and invisible Christ is supreme over all well we thank God and praise him for his wisdom in both gospels don't we and we can see the wisdom of God in these two gospels and what he's doing with both gospels we can see how he is in both gospels both are about him and both are about Christ. They just belong in their own dispensation. They just belong in their own dispensation. Well, next week in Lesson 4 of our Galatians study, Paul publicly confronts Peter, and we're going to examine Peter's behavior in an attempt to understand it and to learn from it. So until then, let's close in prayer. Thank you, Lord God, for Paul and his love and commitment to the church, the body of Christ. We are grateful he stood firm for the gospel of grace. And we thank you that Peter understood and accepted Paul at the Jerusalem meeting. We know your hand was guiding and directing this very, very important meeting. How wise you are, O oh God. And that you choose to share your plans with us is just amazing and we are humbled what other word is there lead us in your ways as we study your word in jesus name amen <laughs>